Hey, Sargon. Hello. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing good. How is uh, the whole corona situation treating you? Well, I'm very bored. <laughs> I'd like everything to go back to normal now. Uh, <clears throat> have you been doing anything uh, new during uh, this whole situation that you weren't doing before? Uh, exercising daily, actually. Oh, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm not going to lie. It's... I think the coronavirus is making us all more virtuous. Um, yeah, I've actually been, I've actually been doing quite well. So I'm quite pleased with myself. All right. Well, good. So um, I am sure you have probably got uh, a lot of other things to do. I know you're quite busy, so we'll jump right into this. Uh, before mm -hmm. we get started here, I just want to say if there's any questions you aren't comfortable taking, you don't want, um, just go ahead and say so. We'll move on. Or you can deflect in a clever way, and I'll pretend you know we didn't see it. And, you know, we'll go from there. I'll try and answer everything forthrightly. All right. So let's see here. Uh, first question we've got uh, comes from, uh, I can't remember, I can't pronounce this guy's name. He's an Irish guy we've got on the server. He wants to know, how do you feel about Irish reunification? Um, I don't care, actually. I personally have no particular... Um, stake in sorry i'm just adjusting some stuff uh, stake in the irish question um as long as it's done democratically as i understand it the irish free state was voted for and then the north voted to remain so i say let these things be done democratically all right oh and another quick question here so we normally uh i ask most of the questions but if someone's a uh a regular here who we trust to not troll anything, we let them ask the question. Are, are you okay, okay with that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right, so our next question here is from Lil Bill. He wants to know, are you a coffee or tea type of person? Tea. What kind of tea do you drink? English breakfast? Um, well, <laughs> uh, personally, I like uh, Yorkshire Gold. I think that's very good. All right. Uh, Bamboo Bob wants to know, why shouldn't prostitution be legal? I think it should be legal. Oh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, pres presuming we don't define prostitution uh, exclusively to mean coerced ladies, perhaps? Mm -hmm. You know, assuming that we can agree that a lady can consent to be a prostitute, which I think they can. I don't see why that shouldn't be a legal transaction. All right. Um, sorry, I was, uh, was getting a little bit. Uh, Bob wants to know, was there any sexual tension between you and Jim? Yeah, but only on my part. <laughs> All right, let's see. Is Doughboy in here? Okay, Doughboy uh, is not here yet. So um, Doughboy wants to know, does the right wing have their own version of political correctness and identity politics? Um, yes. Uh, for them, it's religious, though. Okay. And to be honest with you, in most, in most respects, they're actually quite tolerant. The problem, I think, is the vociferousness of left-wing activism that provokes them. Um, the abortion issue, I think, is the best example of this, right? It's the, the left has got very weak arguments for abortion. Uh, I hate to say this, and I, I know a lot of left-wingers are probably going to screech when I say that, but most left-wing uh, arguments for abortion are, are grounded in pragmatism. It's like it's the best thing to do for the child. The mother shouldn't should be a, you know they should have the right to choose and all this sort of stuff. Well, that's a, that's a principled argument, but um, a lot of them are bound in uh, pragmatism. And then when principles conflict, the question is, you know, which principle is superior? Um, if the left had a more pluralistic view on this, instead of just demanding abortion, uh, ha uh, demanding abortion access uh, universally and on demand, then I think the right would probably shut up about it a lot more, because... A lot of right-wing women really don't like abortion. It is not just men trying to shut down abortion clinics, right? Right. It's religious. Um, and I think that that 
if that's what a, a state votes for, then I think they should be able to vote for that. It's, um, it is something that I think the left doesn't appreciate the depth of the moral feeling on the right in this regard. Um, and it's hard to disagree because whether you like it or not, you are ending human life, you know, or all of the minutiae about, well, you know, well, you know, we define it at this, that or the other and the heartbeat and all this. Honestly, it just makes you seem kind of ghoulish, uh, especially when you say, oh, but every human life is precious. Like, you know, look at these poor homeless people. It's like, OK, yeah, that, that sucks. I agree. But I don't think that if the fetus had any way of telling us, they'd be like, yeah, OK, go on then. If it's going to inconvenience the mother or something. And then the left takes this absconding of their moral duty about the care of human life when it comes to the unborn child and expands it to, actually, it's a moral good to have abortions. Shout your abortion. I've had 21 abortions. I saw a picture of a woman wearing a fucking shirt that said, I've had 21 abortions. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty liberal guy. I think that people probably should have bodily autonomy. But I do think there has to be an understanding that there is a moral conflict there. You know, it's not good to have an abortion. It might be moral, morally necessary to do so. For example, if you're a rape victim and you've become impregnated from that, I can completely, un I completely support the moral argument in that circumstance. But generally, if you've been lax, you haven't been... I mean, and there, there are women who use it as birth control. And it, that, that, to me, I understand where the Christians are coming from. This is getting to truly disgusting territory. These people are vile. And that's coming from someone who believes they should have the right to have an abortion. So the, the, the left needs to be less categoric and more accepting that the right could raise moral objections in these regards. And that I, I do think it comes from the, the kind of sacredness aspect that Jonathan Haidt talks about. It's weird how the left holds nothing to be sacred. And it's quite disturbing, actually. And I don't mean... I know when people say the left, everyone's going to go, oh, no, no, all leftists, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I know, I know. But there is a very materialist strain of thought that dominates the left. And you have to accept that that's there because it, it just manifests everywhere. And it wins the left-wing arguments. That's the problem. Like, the left-wingers who fight against that don't do a very good job. And I, I really think that this is a form of extremism, and it leads people down a path. I mean, like the, the organ harvesting that goes on at abortion clinics. Well, it's a good source of stem cells. Okay. But just because it's a good source of stem cells doesn't mean that there isn't something sacred about a human. I think there is something that we should consider to be sacred about a human. I think on a... And I'm, I'm a totally irreligious guy. I don't believe in God. I don't understand the value of prayer or anything like that. But I think that on a human level, if we don't consider just being human a, a sacred enough position, then we have a problem. And it's even more concerning because the, the Enlightenment was not meant to be a replacement for religion, right? It was, it, it was not meant to be this thing that it's become. And there, is, there are aspects to being a human that the Enlightenment doesn't deal with well and religion is actually one of those aspects and you can see this through the various failed attempts to either replace it uh, with a different religion or supplant it with a cult of reason or something like that uh, these are ridiculous cringe at the very best um, and I think uh, I think the left needs to think about that all right so <coughs> Grossus Fluxoig wants to know did you notice that you returned to your posh way of saying issue I haven't. I'm, haven't I? I'm sure. I, I'm sure. I would still say issue. <laughs> maybe. I, maybe I have. Maybe I. Just, maybe I'm <laughs> shit. Well, I'm, no, okay. Well, now I'm going to be looking out for it. So I'm sorry if I did. I, I really have been trying to maintain this. I don't like it at all. It's all right. We'll we'll help you keep an eye out for it. <laughs> uh, good, thanks. No, thank you, guys. I'm not a part of the London crowd. I will never live in London. I don't want to operate any businesses from London. I don't like London as a city. <laughs> I don't like what capital cities do to a country. They've got this hollowing out effect of draining the rest of the country of its talent, and that creates a class of people who are fucking insufferable. And I don't want to join that class of people. All right. So for everyone in the chat, um, 
Uh, if you want to ask your questions, uh, write them in the Saga of Akkad questions channel. You can discuss in the AMA discussion. Uh, and if you'd like to ask your question yourself in voice chat, um, we're only going to do that for people who we've known on the server for a while and trust. But you, if you want to do that, mark VC at the beginning of your question. Uh, and just so you guys know, if you're writing new questions, uh, we have some from uh, you know last couple of days. So I'll be mixing them in here and there. And obviously, we can't get to all the questions. But uh, next question. There's been a few on this line. Uh, the Meme Lord wants mm -hmm. to know, uh, which candidate in the Democratic primary was your favorite and why? Even if you hated them all, which one did you dislike the least? Um, I don't I don't hate uh, anyone that I can think of. Like even even you know the worst murderers and dictators, I don't personally hate them. Uh, I always, I always feel hate should be if if someone has personally wronged you. I think that that's when hate is legitimate. Um, I think that general abstract hatred of something in principle, I think that's wrong, and I think that shows a lack of self control um, fundamentally. Um, but I don't know. I didn't like they were they were all bad. They're all really bad. I mean, the only one I really actually liked was Tulsi Gabbard. I think Tulsi's great. Um, I think she's a very reasonable person. And that's why the Democrats hate her and portrayed her as a villain. Like, they, I mean, she, I guess she didn't help by being the kind of strong and empowered woman that they claim they want to see, but in opposition to themselves, the, the sort of progressive types. Um, because she, I think she's a proper sort of liberal rather than a progressive. Um, but I, I like Tulsi, and I, I could... If the Democratic Party wasn't so disgustingly riddled with communists and identity politicians, I could easily have found myself supporting Tulsi, especially if the Republicans had gone for like a Mitt Romney or something. Um, definitely. <coughs> but Trump is uh, fantastic for what I think needs to happen at the moment. So I'm, I'm loving what Trump's doing at the moment, generally. I mean, he's terrible ambassador for things that I want but I guess I'll have to deal with that um, but I think I would have preferred it if Bernie had won because I think that the the communists and the, you know, the, the socialists who support Bernie I want them to suffer a catastrophic and resounding defeat because anyone in the 21st century who calls himself a socialist needs to go home and rethink their fucking life there is an ideological structural problem with the idea of socialism, especially if you, especially if you're any kind of Marxist socialist. This is materialistic ideology is is just wrong. It's wrong. All of human history is not purely class conflict. If you try to reduce a multi-dimensional, so many dimensions to history, and reduce that to one analysis. You are effectively a liar, right? There have been many other things that have been not been related to class that have hugely influenced the course of world events since the dawn of time. It's not that the material conditions have never played a role or a, a, a significant factor or possibly even a primary factor in some of them, but they're not the only one. And so fundamentally, Marx's analysis is dishonest at this point. And it is from this point of dishonest analysis that horrific tyrannies and genocides have occurred over and over and there's no it seems to me there's no way of implementing socialism without actually tyrannizing people because socialism is akin to banditry so no i think that any, anyone anyone who calls himself socialist is, should be embarrassed of themselves which is why i wanted bernie to win because the american people will never vote for a socialist the the 30 odd percent of millennial cultists who have been persuaded that they can never achieve and everyone's doomed by their left-wing professors, they can, they can just suffer this defeat and know what it is to actually suffer something. Because a lot of the time, these people are fucking spoiled, and I fucking hate it. This is the thing, right? Communists, you don't want the world that you're creating, right? You don't want a world where there is absolutely no deprivation at all, because that turns out to be the most insufferable kind of people in the world. People who are hypersensitive, who can't take any kind of dealing, right? Who can't take any kind of roughness back and forth and that's a part of being human that's a dimension of the human experience and if you don't give people roughness in their life they will go and seek it like they will seek out danger if they live a safe life because they want innately to have that aspect of the human experience obviously i'm not suggesting by the way we should go to banditry and 
aspect of warlordism or anything like that, but you can't create this kind of hyper cotton wool padded world where everything is it, like nothing can ever be a danger to you. That's a terrible world to live in. And the problem that I really have with it, apart from the fact that it's going to create annoying, insufferable humans, is the fact that all human relationships are built on necessity. A parent needs a child. You know, they feel this longing and sudden. The child physically needs the parents. You, all of these things are built on necessity. And if there's no reason that you have no like, economic ties to your parents or your children or your friends or whatever it is, if you can be that atomized individual who will just get money from the state or wherever it is you think they're going to get money from, then eventually that's all people will be. They will all break down into this because you're incentivizing it. And that's not good for the person. I think that creates people with massive psychological issues. If the millennials I argue with on Twitter or anything to go by, they're all put <laughs> depressed in their bio. And then when you say to them, oh, well, depression's bad, it's like, oh, I'm fine, fuck off. It's like, there, there are things that people need. And if we break all of these bonds, and the thing is, Marx complained about this in the Communist Manifesto. He says the capital has broken all the bonds of sacredness between the Lord and the peasants and all this sort of stuff. It's like, yeah, sure, but why carry on doing that then? Why establish an explicitly materialist view of the world that will literally make sure that everyone is exactly the same and nobody needs anyone else? If that's bad, why carry on from that starting point? But, uh, but this, again, this is why I'm not a communist. But yeah, so cool. Bernie, so get absolutely fucking crushed. Because it'd be wall to wall, Bernie going, bread lines were a good thing, the Soviet Union was great. It'd be wall to wall that from the, the Trump propaganda campaign. And he would do worse than Jeremy Corbyn. He would do way worse than Jeremy Corbyn. And what was frustrating about Jeremy Corbyn is that the Tories were not more aggressive at pushing the fact that he is, unironically, an enemy of Britain. He absolutely is. And uh, he, you can't think of a terrorist group he hasn't sided with over Britain. It's crazy. I oh, know. Actually, no, that's not fair. ISIS. The only one he didn't side with was ISIS. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, Bernie. <laughs> All <laughs> right. In the least. <laughs> Uh, no, that's an interesting thing you, you point out about, uh, you know, uh, how, you know, a lot of communists want to remove the need to work. I think I heard you roughly saying, but, you know, not it, necessarily the need to work, although I think that is the, the end goal, ideally, of many forms of communism. Uh, but the the idea is that uh, you won't have any bonds of necessity between one another. It will be your own labor that does things. Right. That's uh, yeah. Just the the the, the point for you example, make about a, a um, wife relies on her husband for material possessions, right? She she like a, a housewife mm -hmm. who doesn't work relies on her husband for money. Well, that's a that's a necessary relationship for her. It's one of the things that keeps her invested in marriage. However, if that option is not if if that necessity is not there, and the wife can just get as much money or you know enough money to live comfortably from the state, then the chances of her choosing to break the marriage rather than try and improve the marriage go up drastically you're incentivizing them to do this and the same with children and parents and it's you're going to end up with these entitled insufferable it, like i mean it's people who are literally going to be walking around in a twitter bubble all day and they're just going to blank each other in the street if they don't like each other and stuff like this. it's going to be like awful and it's going to destroy fertility rates. This society is not going to last. Mm -hmm. All right. So next question. This is one of my favorites. Mike Escape wants to know, would you rather fight a lion or a cheetah and why? Oh, a cheetah. A, che a, a, a lion weighs probably like 300, 300 pounds or something like that. And they're raw muscle. Like the the teeth and the jaws and the the leg muscles and stuff and this thing and it can grab too. A lion can, it's got you know retractable claws and can grab those. But a cheetah is basically like a dog because it's built for speed and they weigh like forty or fifty pounds or something. And if you, they they can't even roar, they're not even proper big cats either, right? They're, they're essentially <laughs> just large house cats. And uh, I mean, you could comfortably out wrestle a cheetah easily. I could choke a cheetah to death, no problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've thought long and hard about this question. <laughs> Choke it to it's death. It's not the first time. This, would I, I thought, I've, I've thought about this. No, I could take a cheetah. I mean, they'd bite. Obviously, it'd hurt. But they, they don't have the kind of bone-crushing bite that lions have. They don't have the kind of 
same uh, muscular like ability to wrap uh, and grab that the lion has. And they've got the they don't have the retractable claws. Their claws are like the blunt and always out ones for high speed running. Um, so yeah, I've I've looked into this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are happy to be the beneficiaries of your research mm. here. So, next yeah. question is from Ark. Uh, he wants to know, what is one fact or, st or statistic that is most enraging or disturbing to you? That's a good question. The thing that's most enraging to me. I mean, I can't. I, I, I'm not. I'm not enraged, but I am amazed um, that essentially monogamy doesn't exist in the gay community. I mean, I should, I'm not really amazed, but like, it's it, 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 it's one of those things where, like, I saw a bunch of studies that just charted self-reporting of adultery and the rates of partners in the homosexual community, and. It is essentially a non-monogamous community. All of them, all of them apparently self-report in these studies, and so I'm just like, right, okay, that's not healthy, is it? Like, that's not. I mean, it's, it it doesn't surprise me, it, like that that be the case if men are, men have got generally quite low standards when it comes to women, and so why wouldn't they with each other if they say, oh, I'm horny, I'll have a fuck, you know? Why not? You know, I can, I can totally understand why it happens. But there seems that there should be some kind of understanding that that's not healthy, that's not good, and unsurprisingly, sexual diseases in the gay community are, are rampant and always have been. So it is dangerous. It's it's actually quite irresponsible to be so promiscuous, even if there's no chance of pregnancy. There's still negative consequences, and obviously that. As soon as you start saying, well, hang on, maybe unlimited promiscuous sex isn't actually always good. Like, it's, as soon as you start saying things like that, people are like, oh, my God, he wants to put gays in the club. You know, no, no, no. I just think a bit of personal responsibility might be warranted for your own safety and the safety of others. You know, it's, it is easy to follow the weaker path, but then you're just the incontinent man that Aristotle is describing. You know, you're not being vicious. You're not deliberately hurting people. And you... You know you shouldn't do these things, but you're not being responsible. You're you're not being continent, you know. And I think that um, I think there is an argument to say this is not a virtue to just be someone who sleeps with. I mean, that twenty uh, twenty five percent of gay men have had more than a thousand partners. It's like okay, that's fucking insane. Like I I just can't get my head around it, and I don't I would you know I don't think that's something to be proud of, you know. Um, so I, I guess that is the thing that I just find most mind blowing. I, I don't. I, I'm not like you know disgusted. I, mean, I don't give a shit really. But like, it just strikes me that that's not good. Is that true? Twenty five percent have had more than a thousand partners. That's what this study said. Jeez. <laughs> that's, that's that's the thing, and I'm like, right, okay. But the thing is, if you if you go to like you know some uh, clubs or something like three times a week. That's not even that many years to build up that number. And the thing is, I'm not even saying that if I was gay, I wouldn't do that. That's the thing. <laughs> Next question. So, wait, hang on. <laughs> if you were well, gay, you you'd had... be doing it? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> well, I mean, look, if, if I could get like three different women a week, would I say no to that? And, I mean, may, may, not always. <laughs> I don't think I'd say no always. <laughs> so, you know, uh, pre, pre being married, obviously. Um, so, you know, yeah, I, if you're a single gay guy, I can totally understand why you do it, but I think that you're not doing yourself any favors by doing it. Honestly, general rule of thumb, if something's particularly nice or good, then it's bad for you. Just, just be careful. <laughs> I mean that for anything, actually. All right, so next question is a voice question from Doughboy. Doughboy, are you there? Huh? Well, uh, maybe we'll be back in a minute. Uh, we'll go on to another question. I'm here. Oh, there you are. Go ahead, man. Uh, let me pull up the question. Um, 
Should we have socioeconomic slash class based affirmative action for poor students who can't who get into college but cannot afford it? I definitely think there is an argument for this. Um, however, I do actually think that the the idea of a loan is probably the most morally correct one and the most effective one. Um, the thing, the thing that I am concerned about in this regard is we have a very large number of people going to university, and I think that many of them probably didn't need to go to university and have found themselves saddled with debt for careers that haven't materialized and essentially have degrees that are not of any particular use to the field they end up going into because there is more than one way of gaining knowledge and university was just fetishized by the people who came into it. I mean, in my country, it was done by the Labour Party. And this isn't surprising, given the pedigree of Tony Blair and some of the other uh, high, high, high class people who thought that this would be the answer. But that's actually not the answer, because the problem is, and I don't know how to say this politely, but economic circumstance affects IQ and IQ is your abstract reasoning ability and that is the underpinning of academic work and so if you have that doesn't mean that the, the people with low IQ are stupid that means that they're not academic and that's fine there are, like I said there are many ways of obtaining knowledge and many ways of demonstrating intelligence um, and the obsession with university seems to have come in at least in my country from the, the perspective of everyone's equal, which they're not, um, in every regard, which they're certainly not, and therefore we should be trying to shunt people to university who otherwise are not especially well equipped for it. Um, this makes universities less prestigious, obviously, and a joke, in fact, as a consequence, as everyone is sent there as affirmative action, effectively. Um, but what we should do is just offer loans to people who reach the required prerequisites, frankly. Um, I'm very sick of this, like, oh, we should do it through the government. Well, why? That's not really any different to a loan. We all still have to pay it. And I don't really see why someone who doesn't get uh, an education at university has to contribute to someone else's education at university, especially when you can just pay for your own and then get a job and pay it back, which I think, how can you argue with that? You are being given the money for your education up front. This is an investment that you're making in your future. And therefore, you'll probably, I would have thought, stay at university more to the end more, more frequently. Because if people like, hey, here's free money from the government, go to university if you feel like it. Well, I mean, I dropped out after two years and I had a loan. I imagine there are going to be people with far less... Uh, far less... Um, restraint than I do who just don't fuck it I don't like this after six months you know I think the the dropout rate is probably something that increases I'm sure there are figures to show whether it is or isn't and I'm right or wrong but again morally it seems fair that if you pay for your own education then that's the best thing you can do and taking out a loan seems like a perfectly fair way of doing that so and it, it seems that we have more people in university now than ever and that's the that's the condition we have in my country so it's not like it's disincentivizing people to go to university or anything so don't go and get that gender studies degree because you might earn some money in the real world. I have one more question. Do people who lab themselves, label themselves as anti-Zionist tend to exhibit more anti-Semitic tendencies or expressions? Hmm. I think an easy answer to this would just be to say yes. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, Someone who is an anti-Semite is probably going to be attracted to the idea and label of anti-Zionist because it will in some way align with their desire to reduce Jewish power, which is fundamentally at the root of anti-Semitism. When you collectivize a race, what you do is turn each individual in that race into an agent of racial power. And so to be against Jews means to be reducing the influence and power of Jews. Um, and so that would be an easy 
answer, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think there are principled objections to Zionism, and I don't want to just lump those people who have principled objections into the same category as people who are just driven by hatred and bigotry. Um, and I haven't spent enough time in anti-Zionist communities to be able to give my subjective impression of them. Um, but if I were to guess, I would probably say yes, because of the disproportionate presence of anti-Semites. Like I said, I think they're drawn to these things because of their desire to reduce Jewish power. So I think that's my answer to that one. Thanks. No problem. All right. Uh, our next question comes from Lil Bill. He wants to know, do you support Edward Snowden and Julian Assange? Um, 100%. And everyone who has persecuted them uh, from any position is in the wrong. And it's frustrating that the Russian government can have a coup over us in this regard by giving Snowden the protection that the American government should have given him for being a whistleblower. Uh, it, I'm I'm totally with um, the most radical of free speech positions on this. Uh, I I really think that the dissidents are the things that keep a democracy healthy, because it is them who are on the first path that will eventually end in revolution. And so let's talk to the dissidents now, see what they have to say that's legitimate, and bring them into the main. Uh, and if this requires them to leak information that otherwise contractually and, and often legally they would be in trouble for leaking, uh, I think that if they have done us a service and revealed something to the public that was being kept secret by the government, then there is no option but for the public to adopt them as their champions. Uh, it's natural that the government and the mainstream, and even uh, when we say government, I don't mean the party that's currently administering the country. I mean the organs of the state, the the thing that the the people in the offices doing things. The, the I guess what we can just for shorthand call the deep state, uh, but the the civil servants. They're they're going to find these people to be objectionable and will push against them as much as they can because these people are revealing to the world what uh, the bureaucrats are doing. And bureaucrats very rarely like that. They don't tend to court the media. Um, that's the, what the politicians are for, incidentally. So, yeah, 100%. All right. Uh, this next question comes from one just of my... Just to add, I think, oh, go ahead. before I go on, yeah, just, I, I think that Chelsea Manning doesn't get enough credit either because she actually spent time in jail. I think it's because generally she's got a bit of an insufferable personality, but that doesn't reduce the dignity of the sacrifice that she made to let us know what she let us know. All right. This next question comes from one of my favorite users. Probably Tim wants to know, do you believe that internet culture has become more toxic over time? And what do you think about the use of the word toxic? The use of the word toxic in and of itself is not awful. It, 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 I mean, there, there are things that can be described as uh, metaphorically toxic. Um, the problem is always in the application of these things. And I think that, I mean, in many regards, it's not even uh, a, an objection that's without merit, even from communities that are well-meaning. Um, I think a lot of communities don't understand how they treat outsiders, how they treat people who differ. Um, I'm not surprised. I mean, one of the, like, here's a silly example. I, I love the game Bannerlord. I follow a bunch of the groups on online. And if someone posts something that is a reasonable criticism of the game, because, I mean, the game's in early access, so it's not finished. So there are going to be lots of reasonable criticisms of the game. Right? But if someone posts a reasonable criticism of the game, the very next reply, and it'll be massively upvoted, is, well, go away if you don't like it. It's like, th they didn't say they didn't like it. Why are you reacting in such a hostile way was why are you being attacked you know you're not being attacked when they criticize the game so why are you acting this way and i think a lot of people take these criticisms as a form of attack of the community who likes the thing uh, essentially because they've i suppose taken it upon themselves to treat this thing as if it doesn't have any problems it doesn't have any mistakes like i think donald trump's great but there's no way i'm going to turn around and say that donald trump 
doesn't have any problems, right? Like he's he's never made a mistake or he, he's a brilliant rhetorician or something like that. I'm never going to say anything like that. You just accept the flaws of the things that you love. And then, again, you've got a more comprehensive and like holistic view of the thing because it is what it is. And the, the flaws are also a part of the character of the thing. And it's the character of the thing that I think you like. You know, when you, you find yourself drawn to something, you probably can't exactly say why I, you know, I've, I've got like my cup on my desk and it's a beautifully crafted cup. And I, but it's got a few chips and scratches. But the thing is, that kind of makes me understand the essence of it more. It's my cup. You know, that's it's not someone else's cup. If I saw another cup that didn't have these chips and scratches, you know, I wouldn't feel attached to the same way. You know, silly example, but you know what I'm trying to say. And uh, and it's weird that people have this desire to find the perfect thing that they can venerate. Uh, there, are, there are no perfect things. There is no such thing as perfection. Perfection is the end of life. Life is movement. Perfection is the end of movement. It's the end of everything. It, it's, a, it's a, everything cast in marble. That's what it is. All right. And on that, Makala wants to know Vlandia or Kuzate? <laughs> um... Aesthetically, Vlandia, but the Kuzait uh, glaives are spicy. Mm. All right, let's see. I always like playing as uh, what is that one that they look like Vikings. Uh, they they're not in the new one. Uh, the the Vikings have kind of been phased out for a cross on one side between like the Celts and the Slavs, and then on the other side. Um, I don't know, just the Slavs. Like the, the, the Vikings, are they're essentially just the Sea Raiders now, but they still don't have that kind of Viking aesthetic that they had prior. And they don't tell you that they're going to drink from your skull, so it's kind of disappointing. So, <laughs> but I'm sure someone can mod that in. Yeah. Uh, now, isn't there one in the north? That's the one that lives in the ice. They, they, kinda, they always they're have like... They're Sturgia, but they're not really very Viking. Eh. Or at least they don't seem like that. I don't know. I they got axes and round shields. It's close enough for me. Well, yeah, I guess if that's the <laughs> the, the low bar you're setting. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our next question comes from uh, Libertarian Math Yoda. He wants to know uh, if you could give an example of what you would consider to be a good critique and a bad critique of the labor theory of value. Hmm. I've yet to hear a good critique of the labor theory of value. Uh, sorry, a bad critique of the labor theory of value. Um, it seems to be fairly self-evident that the labor theory of value is nonsense. Uh, it doesn't matter how much labor you put in something that has no demand, uh, it's worth nothing. So that's that, as far as I can see, that that's the end of the labor theory of value. I'm sure there are arcane, uh, detailed, because, I mean, you know, Marx has undoubtedly wrote chapters on this. Um, and so there, there are going to be like artail, arcane, detailed, uh, monolithic books that just go through. Oh, look at all these inner workings! But if you fail on this, the, the fundamental principle in that regard, then there's just no point discussing theory. So I've never looked into it any deeper, to be honest. I'm aware of what it is, but uh, I've not gone through the formulations that he used and the calculations to try and establish how one could objectively calculate the price of goods. Because I don't think such a thing's possible. I think the price is set by the the subjective desires of the individuals who are buying and selling. Um, mm -hmm. And so essentially, I think it's probably all he can do is calculate an average or something like this. But um, but I don't even know why such a thing would be desirable. I don't know why you would want someone to be able to calculate the price of your goods. Right? That's again, that's completely up to you to set. And I presume that the, the labor theory of value is behind the idea that people have... Uh, I've heard a few people say things like, you know, uh, profit is theft. It's like, really? That's a very interesting position. Um, I presume that the labor theory of value is behind that because essentially they've calculated what they believe to be the correct price. And then so any price above that is de facto a form of theft. Um, but I don't agree with that. I think it's nonsense. Um, but that's, that's pretty much all I've ever bothered with on the labor theory of value, I'm afraid. All right. This next one's a little bit hot and controversial. Sushi wants to know, is a hot mm. dog a sandwich? Well, um, I, I, I hate the fact that Americans call burgers sandwiches. 
are not the sandwiches, the burgers. There's a qualitative difference between the two. Um, no. O only a, a sandwich has a, a narrow definition. It's two slices, so sliced bread, manually or machine is fine, uh, with a filling in between them. That is what it is. It's not a bun. It's not a roll. It's not, um, I don't know, a baguette. It's not any of those things. It's not even a loaf sliced into. That's not a sandwich either. Um, it's two slices of bread between, uh, with filling between. All right. And that's official. <laughs> and, and I'm also curious, what should we do with people who put pineapples on pizza? Uh, I'm pro pineapple on pizza. Because <gasps> I'm a liberal. I like you filthy conservatives. Well, uh, we'll just move on from that. I don't want to touch <laughs> that one. Um, <laughs> That's right. I'm a progressive now. <laughs> now it's mandatory pineapple on pizza. <laughs> pineapple phobes. I'm a pineapple phobe. I'll, I'll accept that. He's a big. He admits it. Deplatform him. <laughs> Zep wants to know, how many sugars do you put in your coffee, or should we say tea here? Zero, because uh, for, for a couple of reasons. I lost two teeth to drinking Coca-Cola in my 20s. Mm. Uh, I, for some reason, didn't listen to the advice that I was told all growing up as a child. Oh, this will rot your teeth. Well, they were right, and I was uh, lazy and decided to ignore it. Because I, I indulged, because I enjoyed Coca-Cola, but uh, it was terribly bad for me. Um, I don't know many like health effects from it i'm just annoyed that i lost two teeth from it um but uh these days i'm on a keto diet um and i have had no sugar deliberately since january this year i'm a main now so five months um i accidentally drank a third of a bottle of sugary coke because i picked up the sugary version rather than the non-sugary version the other day which was actually kind of disgusting and gave me the sweats and it made me feel like I was going to pass out uh, because I haven't had sugar for so long. And I, I, I've, your taste buds change as well. Um, so after a while, things that don't taste sweet are in, unbearable. Like normal milk is unbearable for me to drink because it tastes like sugar. Um, and so I have to have almond milk, which has literally zero sugar in it, as a replacement. But because of the way that I've train myself through habit now I actually much prefer that over milk itself because it's not sweet um, and so I'm uh, yeah hyper, like tomatoes are unbelievably sweet I had, I had some I don't normally have tomatoes because they're full of sugar but uh, I decided I was going to go wild and have some bolognese sauce not the pasta because that's carbs and sugar um, but I had some of the bolognese sauce and my you know my wife was like oh it's got like You'll, you'll get 10 grams of sugar or something. Or that, I can't remember the 10. I can't remember the quantity, but it's, you know, if I go over 20, that's bad. And I was like, right, okay, I've been strict. So I can, I can spoil myself and have a bit of bolognese sauce. And it was like a dessert to me. It was crazy. Um, so zero is the answer. All right. Doesn't sound very British of you. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Um, <laughs> but I have lost over a stone and a half at this point so I'm what the hell is a stone uh well you've got to understand right so our country begins with probably in the in the in the late iron age <laughs> so measuring people's weight in stones was probably a thing <laughs> no. um i don't know it's i think it's about uh, 35 pounds in american speak okay all right well here's to uh, you know i mean like obviously geez one and a half stone that's pretty good um, good luck uh, getting to losing a boulder, I guess, we should, if you want to use that. <laughs> that's, that's excellent. I can't believe no one said that to me before. <laughs> one and a half stone. Wow, you need, to, you need to get to a boulder. I, think, well, I like that. All right. Uh, Step Cake wants to know, how many genders are there? Two. And if you disagree with me, just name the third gender. No, a gender is not a gender, in the same way that atheism is not a religion. Hmm. So what do you think about the distinction between um, identity, uh, I guess, like, you know, chosen identity, and what you're born with? 
So I think the confusion comes from the concept of what gender is, because up until like the 50s, there was no distinction between sex and gender. Uh, people just, and you, you, you can only understand things that you can define, right? concepts you can define. And so defining the concept of gender in a way is useful, uh, but in another way, it also opens up people to ideological attacks that they don't understand and don't really have any uh, refutation to. Um, the gender is the social construct that is the expression of our masculine or feminine behavior. That's true. But the, the problem that the, the left has, the intersectional left has, with the concept of gender is it's not a transcendent characteristic. And what I mean by that is it is generated by the body. There is a physical component to this. And there is an innate, in, uh, implicit admission of this in the idea of sex change hormones. If you're going to change your body to look like the gender you want to look like, well, then you're saying that the gender that you want to look like has a biological component that is in the physical form. And that's true. <laughs> that is the case. And so it's actually totally logical for the most radical of left-wingers to get to the position where they say things like, gender transition surgery is transphobic. And that is the radical left position, and that's the correct intersectional position on gender. If gender is transcendental, then there is no connection between the gender and the physical person. So wanting to make the body look different is actually a form of bigotry that's your in internalized transphobia that you're dealing with there and you shouldn't have any worry about that the the term i mean the the, the term woman was recently described i can't remember who described it but it was like you know some un women's panel or something in fact it was a panel of the un women's conference and they were describing they, and they were literally saying well women are you know ageless eternal formless and i'm like they sound like a fucking cthulhu elder horror when you say it like that, you know, a no, a woman is a defined thing. And this is why uh, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, or former leader, melted down on radio when she was asked to define what a woman is. It took her like 10 minutes to stumble through nothing because she couldn't define it. Because if anyone can be a woman and no biological attributes are occurred, then what is a woman? What is anything? You know, suddenly we're unraveling all these concepts. Or you've got the turf position, which is the correct position. Like, if you ask any random person on the street to define a woman, they'll say something along the lines of adult human female. And that means that adult human males are not adult human females. Because that doesn't involve the gender. Like that's, that doesn't involve, like, like the, the opinion of the person. That's just a physical description of the person. And that is, like, 99% of people on the street will say that, which makes all of the world full of turfs. And that puts the intersectionals against odds with not just the ideas in billions of people's heads, but the reality that people see that there is a connection between biological sex and a person's gender identity. Like everyone can see this. Everyone can tell that the, the gender expression, the, the gender role itself, is, is an expression of biological needs. Men and women need a way to be able to understand how to interact with one another, not just to form relationships and form families and have kids and carry on civilization which presumably is why it occurred, but also for the safety of both sides, to know how the other person, to have, not just to know, but like have a, have a rough guide to how the other person expects to be treated. Because in general, if it's a social construct, okay, name me the third gender. What am I supposed to do? Or like, let's just call it Zia or something. Let's say something like, what do I do with Zia when we go out on a date? Do I pull out the chair for them? Do I not pull out the chair? Nobody knows. How do I know? We don't know. I, I asked for their pronouns. Great, now I've got your pronoun. What next? You've got nothing. You have not constructed a gender role. That's why there are only two. You haven't constructed a third one to tell me how I'm supposed to deal with you. That doesn't exist. And so it's like, okay. And if you did construct it, why the fuck should I accept it? Because you are quite obviously either a male or a female, and therefore I could still just treat you like a man or a woman, and you would understand the social cues I'm giving you. You know, and the, the idea that you, it's a demand, that you have to respect the pronouns and all sorts of stuff, I don't agree that you have that kind of, um, you don't have that kind of requ uh, level of authority to request me to do this. You don't have the moral authority and you shouldn't have the physical authority. And I should be at liberty to say, no, I will actually call you what I want because fundamentally 
I should be free to be an asshole if I want. You know, I will just call you a cunt if I fancy it, regardless of your gender. You know, I should be free to do that. There may be many reasons I don't want to do that, but my my right to do that should be something I have liberty, uh, have access to. So. All right, the freedom to be an asshole. Hmm. <coughs> All but right. also, your the, the, the left-wing concept of gender is woefully inadequate. And it's ironic, considering they study it all the fucking time. Alright, guys, so we are here talking with Rick Grimes' son from The Walking Dead, Carl. <laughs> uh, if you want to ask questions, put it in Sargon of Akkad questions, and uh, you can discuss in the AMA discussion. Uh, if you want to invite your friends, uh, the invite is just discord.gg slash bluepolitics. Our next question... Um, uh, oh, Jesus. How to say his name? Sachiari. Sachiari. Uh, are you here, man? Uh, yes, I'm here. My name is Zachary. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's the Scottish spelling of of my actual... It's the Scottish spelling of my actual name, so... Uh, in one of your streams, older streams, Sargon, um... One other guy said that we give ourselves rights. So I was wondering, how do you define a right? Well, that's a good question. Um, it depends on your position, I suppose, it seems. I personally like the classically liberal view that rights are inherent to your person. So you have the right to associate, to speak, to think as you want. You have the right to bodily integrity. These are all things that are found inside ourselves. Um, the, the thing that a right, I think, is not is something that is contingent on something else, as in outside of yourself. It's not something that requires another person. So if you want to find out what your rights are, drop a man on an island. Leave him, leave him and see what he does. Those things that he, he does or does not suffer are going to be his rights. Um, I don't think you can have a right to health care, for example. You can have an entitlement to health care, but that comes with it different connotations, doesn't it? You know, if, for exactly. example, in my yeah. country, a, bu a bunch of the doctors, uh, the, the national health service that we have, a bunch of the doctors got together and said, oh, it's wrong that we charge foreign patients to use the NHS. No, it's actually completely right. The NHS is not a, a limitless, formless entity like a woman. It actually has limits. It's definable limits. We know how to find these limits are. We know exactly how many people work there and how much money this costing us as the taxpayer. And if these people are not paying taxes in this country, then they derive no entitlement to use it. And so if they want to use it, they should take some insurance, like I do when I go on holiday to other places. Um, and the thing is, the insurance is not usually that expensive either, because most people probably don't need the fucking insurance. Um, it's just there as insurance. But the point is, that's what gives you an entitlement to use that healthcare system, because otherwise it's not yours. You didn't do anything to create the resources that sustain it. You are not owed service from other people. Unless, of course, you've paid for it. And that's that's basically how I view rights. And I think that's the, the correct view of view, the way of viewing rights. Just declaring something that is subject to scarcity to be a right is wrong. It's not correct. Because rights can neither be expanded nor contracted. The number of rights are exactly proportional to the number of human beings. Because the rights are contained in each individual human being. Hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks, Scottish Zachary, uh, for that question. Um, yeah, our cool. next question comes from Soviet Frogs. They want to know, why do you hate the EU? <laughs> well... Lots of, lots, lots of, uh, again, we, I, I don't hate the EU. I don't like, I don't consider it to be a particularly democratic institution. Um, fundamentally, it's not operated, well, no, on, on a surface level, I dislike the way it operates. I don't like empowering bureaucrats to that degree generally. I'm a very big believer in uh, Bertrand Russell's view that bureaucracy is actually the enemy of the individual because it puts a person at the mercy of a giant machine that, actually doesn't care about them very much but is obliged to do x y or z as contractually for the existence of the bureaucracy 
uh, is required, but it's also staffed by people who are incentivized to not give a shit about you. You know, these people do not get bonuses for having done good performance. There is no benefit to good customer service in a state bureaucracy, for example. Why? What difference does it make? I've got to come to you. You're the only game in town when it comes to X, Y, or Z. So that you, you've got no incentive to get anything done for anyone else, which is why I think these bureaucracies are so shit. Um, and so that, that like creating a giant uh, corporatized governmental bureaucracy, I think is a terrible idea. And it gives these bureaucrats who are not elected by the people an unbelievable amount of influence over their lives, whether they like it or not. But then secondly, I just don't like the idea of, uh, but fundamentally, I don't like the idea of mass centralization of power like that. I mean, the problem I ha the, the main problem that I have with socialism, for example, is that it wants to be a governmental structure. If socialists were all like, look, we're going to be a bunch of fucking hippies and live in a commune, I would say, brilliant, more power to you. Have a good time. You know, get, I hope I hope you find the happiness you're looking for. Um, they don't, but that's a different story. The problem is, you no, know, we've got to command vast economies of millions of people, like 500 million people in the Soviet Union uh, were being tyrannized by this and it's by a bureaucracy <laughs> and it's it comes from a position and it, it sorry it attracts people who think that they have all the fucking answers and if there's one thing i've learned in life is that the world is horrifically complex i mean you can you can find like in innocent the third's letters uh, a, a medieval pope who essentially ruled europe with his his letter writing ability um he just there's this one quote, it was used in a Rome Total War game, which, but it sticks in my mind because of the relevance of it. And it's just like, do you have any understanding? Uh, do you have, no, do you, do you have any knowledge of how, with how little understanding the world is governed? And if that has been proven by anything, it's the COVID-19 crisis, right? People are not the godlike technocrats that they want to be. They do not have the kind of knowledge of the world that they want to have, and they have deluded themselves into thinking they do. And one of the great ways of proving this well, it doesn't, not just the COVID-19 stuff, climate change, right? I believe that human activity probably has an effect on the planet. However, I don't believe that the models that are being used are correct. We were being, in the 70s, we were told that it would be, that everyone was going to an ice age. Then we were told by 2006 or whatever it was, that there would be no polar ice caps. Neither one was true. And so you've got to look at this record of mistakes and say your understanding of what you're talking about is much better than mine, but it's not good enough to be able to predict the future. And so we can't just rely on it 100%. And the same happened with, uh, I think it was Neil Hamilton, the guy's name was. His, his, his coronavirus model it was just a computer program that was way inflating the numbers of people who get sick because he didn't know how contagious and what the death rates would be. He didn't know this before making the model. Uh, but yet we've operated on these models in, in this country. We've operated on this model. I don't know about other countries. Um, and it's destroyed our economy. Today, I went into town because I was, uh, I'm, I'm, I was looking to hire a business, hire, hire a rent a, a property for, so I can do a business. And I was walking through the town square, uh, town centre, looking at the sheer number of for sale signs on shuttered small businesses and it was just like fuck man this is like it's post-apocalyptic this if this was the black death this would not be worth it this is too much you know people should be free to make their own decisions even if that mean even if there's a deadly plague you know the government should not have done this especially with the level of knowledge about the disease itself like the cdc put out a thing where it was uh, what was it, less than 1% death rate from COVID-19? This is not justified at all. And yet, because of the fear, because of the lack of knowledge and the belief that we have control over these things, we've leapt, and it's ridiculous. And China's laughing. <laughs> so it's, I, 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 I hate the EU for that reason. They, it's a centralization of bureaucrats who think they can solve the world's problems and they've done nothing but fuck it up. Like, if you were evaluating the EU... If you were playing Rome Total War, right, or Crusader Kings or something, you were evaluating the EU, you'd be like, this is an unstable mess that's about to collapse. The, the second largest contributor has just left. You know, you've got Italy and Poland that, and Hungary that are basically up in arms at this point. And it's like, yeah, yeah, this is not a stable prospect. The, the dream 
of imposing this federalized Euro European super state is not going to happen. The thing's going to collapse way before that does. All right. So next question comes from Stargate Monkey, who's really mad. I haven't asked any of his questions yet, but he has one uh, very relevant point that you were just talking about. He wants to know, what is your opinion um, on the Tories' response to Cummings breaking quarantine when he knew he was infected? Well, I mean, I don't care. <laughs> like, I don't think there should be a quarantine. So the, the, the quarantine seems irrational. You know, it's, it's an unfortunate fact of life that when people get sick, if they are already weak and vulnerable, then they might die. And this is the case every single year with flu and old people. It's, it's normal, it's regular, we don't talk about it. 99% apparently of the cases, of the deaths in northern Italy, uh, were with people who had comorbidities, people already sick. And it's, uh, sorry, what was the question again before I go off? Because I'm worried that I'm going on a tangent there. Sorry, thoughts on the Tory response to Cummings yeah, breaking quarantine. Tangent, yeah, yeah, sorry, I don't want to go off this tangent that wasn't relevant. Um, so I don't really think, and it, there, there's evidence to suggest that the quarantine has made things worse and not better because of a correlation with vitamin D, which is used by your immune system. And this also has a explanatory power over why black and minority ethnic communities are more badly affected by the coronavirus, as well as other factors. But it's one factor in many um, as to why these communities suffer more, because you get less vitamin D from sunlight if you have darker skin, which is honestly the point of light skin. Um, and so, like, I don't I don't think the quarantine is something I agree with. And if Dominic Cur Cummings, sorry, if Dominic Cummings doesn't agree with the lockdown, and I don't know that he does or doesn't, so I if he does agree with it, then yes, he's a hypocrite, and the, the Tories should at least reprimand him. Uh, and they probably should anyway, because that is their official position. Uh, the Conservative Party, Boris came out and said, oh, we're going to extend the lockdown, and everyone's like, for fuck's sake, Boris. And it might be the reason that his um, opinion polling is going down at the moment, um, although I don't know that it is. Uh, but if if Cummings personally disagrees with the lockdown, then, I mean, at least you can say he's not a hypocrite for violating it, although you could also, you know, level these other accusations. But you can definitely lay, level them at the Tory party generally for being so obviously partisan when it came to this. But the thing is, if... We didn't see non-stop, constant, and uncharitable partisan attacks coming from Labour on a daily basis from every single MP they have, then I would make more of a big deal out of it. You know, this if generally the criticisms from Labour were charitable and realistic, I would, and then they then they came up with this, and because the, and, this is a realistic criticism, but it's not a very important one. You know, an accusation of hypocrisy is very very. Not very much more than just being an ad hominem, really. It's like, look at that man. It's like, you know, if a fat guy comes past and says, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be overweight, it's bad for you. Okay, you, <laughs> you of all people saying that, but that's a true statement, whether it comes from him, whether it comes from Usain Bolt, you know. Um, so it's, it's not really much more than hip, uh, an allegation against the man. It's not, not really a proper argument. But, um, but generally, it is embarrassing for the Tories and... I would be angrier if, like I said, the Labour Party and the left generally, like the Liberal Democrats, are just as bad for this. Uh, if they were, if they were not totally uncharitable all the time, it would hold a lot more strength. But uh, frankly, as someone who wants the lockdown over, I don't care. Let's just follow Dominic's example and get on with our fucking lives. <laughs> all right. Our next question comes from uh, Ratmanish. Ratmanish, you there? Hey guys, how are you? How are you guys? Good, thanks. So the question is, uh, do you think uh, that people, and I'm including uh, you in this, do you think that people take uh, online political arguments too seriously? Um, because, of course, I read all the Twitter threads of people being that way. <laughs> the answer but, is just an unqualified yes, Christ. <laughs> and, and, and it's like what I what I realize in daily life is that once uh, the shield of anonymity is removed in real life, uh, people's courage tends to decrease mm -hmm. uh, very severely from what they argue online. And I'm just wondering if the, uh, if the arguments from, uh, from the left and the pushback from the right uh, 
is that just oh, is a lot of that just trumped up for online audiences that doesn't exist in the real world? No, these these things do have real world consequences. Um, but the the online bickering everyone does, and I, myself included, uh, I love the online bickering. I'm not disparaging it at all. It's one of my. It's why I love Twitter. Um, the the online bickering is just team sports, really. I've chosen my team, and therefore very few of these people are engaged in any kind of honest inquiry into their own beliefs or other people's. So I don't think it's much more than the political show, but it's also kind of a hobby. It's I think a lot of people do it for a hobby. I think they it just happens to be like it's like a fandom, right? Like people will come in and out of fandoms, and sometimes fandoms are war. And this is just the political fandom online. Uh, it does matter. I mean, it, I pr I think it probably large ones probably can become very influential and have a real world effect on the normies. Um, Without a doubt, in fact. Um, and this does have consequences, but generally people tie it too much to their own moral character. And really, I mean, your politics is an expression of your moral character, but really everyone's trying to be good. You know, very few people are so driven by hate that they actually want to harm others. Most people, I guess, you know, especially the radical, the revolutionary types, I think they delude themselves into thinking that the opponents are more evil than they are, or that they are more competent and capable and more pure of heart than the, the people who have come before them, which they're not. Um, they're, they're probably roughly the same. There's probably not too much difference. Um, so yeah, we take it too seriously. We, we, we need to decouple it from our emotional perspective a little bit. So it's weird that people who are incredibly scientific, oh, I've got studies to this, I've got studies to that, are really emotional about those studies. You know, that should be something that's done in quite a clinical way because you think a study is a clinical exercise. Yep, thanks. You know, Rob Maj makes a good point. You know, a lot of people on here, you might know me as a brave hero, but in real life, I'm just a coward. So. Oh, yeah, totally. I, I can't see myself being a hero. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, what did Patton say? Uh, Winning a war is not dying for country; it's getting the other poor bastard too. Like, yeah, yes, that's my thought. <laughs> yep. All right. So next question. Oh, Fable had an interesting one. Um, which society do you think would last longer, a narco-communist or a narco-capitalist? <laughs> um. Oh, which one would last longer? I mean, the anarcho like the anarcho capitalists don't like the idea that they're going to devolve into warlordism, and the, you know they'll, they'll go oh, the warlord fallacy. But it is going to happen. Uh, it it like <laughs> if if you can just kill someone and you okay, who's going to drag me to the court? Oh well, I'll I'll pay some enforcers to come around. Well, why the fuck would I respect their authority? Why wouldn't I just pop out my muck nuke and shoot them too? You know, like, there's no particular reason why I wouldn't, and it would just be through fear, and then you've got yourself to the position of a state again, which surely was what you were arguing against at the beginning. So it seems that the the whole purpose of anarchism generally, uh, the, the anarcho-communists are the opposite problem. Uh, some industrious chap will go out and build his cabin in the woods or whatever, and then a, a mob of jackasses, a mob of bandits will come along and say, right, this is our cabin now, comrade, and he'll have no recourse there either. So it's it, it it strikes me that the state in some way is probably necessary, and so I think both of them are going to fail. I mean, I think the communes probably won't last as long as the anarchy from a capitalist perspective, because so I think probably the warlords could hold stronger sway than the collective. So I, I think the ancaps will last longer, but uh, it won't be pretty, and people will be screaming for a government by the time it's over. All right, there's been a few questions about this. Um, just generally, what are your thoughts and your experience with UKIP and accusations that you single-handedly tanked the party? Um, uh, addressing the, the second part first, that people don't understand how these things work. And so if you're exclusively on the internet and, say, viewing the thing from America, 
you might think that I was more important than I actually was. Um, but if you look at the amount of press coverage about me, it, I mean, it seems like a lot from our position on the internet, but it's really not in the real world. Um, nobody, nobody who doesn't watch my channel knows who I am. I, I, the only, the only people I've ever been recognised by who aren't subscribers and friendly towards me have been activists when we're doing something. You know, people who are plugged into the online political bitch fest. You know, the, the, no, no one in the real world has any idea who I am uh, outside of outside of that. So it, it it just doesn't come up. It just you know the 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 idea that they think this was the end for you, and they they they've got to understand like. So much more literature was produced about Tommy Robinson and the association with him in UKIP. And Tommy Robinson is a way more divisive figure in Britain than me. He's, he's the most demonized man in Britain. And so for the press to be able to say, ah, Jared Batten, UKIP, gotcha, that was constant. Ream after ream after ream. But the, 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 that wouldn't really have mattered so much if there wasn't an alternative to UKIP in the European elections. However... Farage had been planning the Brexit party for some time, and it was, he, I mean, he didn't, the, the whole thing essentially stems from a, a schism between Farage and Gerard Batten. Uh, they've hated each other for 25 years because Batten uh, is working class and Farage isn't. And Farage always considered him, even though they were co-founders of UKIP, Farage considered him to be the help, the assistance, the, the employee. And that always riled Gerard uh, fiercely. And so when Farage stepped down, Gerard was forced to take over because it looked like the party was going to collapse. Uh, there was no point donating to UKIP after Brexit had been achieved. Uh, of course, the Conservative government under Theresa May uh, was very, very weak on the subject. And so Farage had the plan for the Brexit party already in the bag uh, before I think he left UKIP, although I can't prove that, but I think that's probably the case. But it was, it was very... It, it, very um, it was very much the strain of thought among the upper echelons of UKIP and and other parties that Farage was going to bail because he'd he's been fighting constantly with the NEC, the National Executive Committee in UKIP, um, which is an elected body that operates. I mean, honestly, it gave a very much sort of EU style vibe to it. A bunch of a, a bunch of people who have got a out, a outright power over the elected party leader. Um, and so it's rather frustrating. And he saw Gert Wilders, and because Gert Wilders had a party of one. And so if people voted for him, that was, you know, him personally. And Farage has got the celebrity to do that. He's a national, international celebrity. Uh, probably the most influential politician in the last 20 years. And that's, no, the last 10. Tony Blair probably gets it before then. But, the, I mean, he's a hugely influential figure. He hugely. He essentially commanded the Tory party uh, and, and forced Boris to adopt his position on Brexit. Um, and it, there was, I mean, even if I'd never, not, or me and Tommy, in fact, or Dank, had never gone anywhere near UKIP. Not that Tommy was ever a member of UKIP because the constitution prevented him from entering. But if, uh, you know, like, Gerard Batten appointed him as his advisor because Gerard likes Tommy. You know, he thinks he's... he's uh, he he thinks much the same way as a lot of people do. He's a a lad, who, uh, you know. He's a, he's a working class lad, so he's a bit, you know. He's got his moments. He's got a criminal record, obviously. But uh, not I'm saying they all do, obviously. But you know what I mean. It's not unusual, uh, especially for things like uh, f mortgage fraud or something. Yeah, I bet there are a lot of people who thought they could get away with it. You know, it's not the it's not the most morally repugnant crime a man can commit, right? Um, I think he also went to jail for punching a Nazi as well once before it was cool. Uh, but Gerard liked him, and so appointed him as his advisor, and that was enough, you know, to tie the two. But even if none of that had happened, if Farage split from UKIP and just started the Brexit party out of hatred of Batten, and no other reason, then that would have been enough to destroy UKIP, because Farage is the name. He is the household name. He's the famous one. Uh, it, where he went, and he had the money too, he, he raised millions of pounds for the Brexit party's launch. And it was everywhere, just, you know, plastered everywhere. Nigel Farage, Brexit Party. UKIP could not compete with that. It just wasn't going to happen. And honestly, I think that's probably the reason for Gerard putting me and Dank up. Like, I think he knew that he couldn't compete with Nigel because Nigel had the connections, Nigel had the money, Nigel had the name. You know, no one had heard of Gerard Batten. It was always Nigel, Nigel, Nigel. 
I think I think he knew. So I think he was just like, yeah, it's worth it's worth giving it a shot. Didn't work, obviously, but like, you know, doesn't really matter. But um, you know, it was inevitable. I think is the way they looked at it. But um, no, I liked UKIP. I had a very good time in UKIP when I was there. Um, it's a shame that it didn't understand its position as a revolutionary party. Um, UKIP was never really a Westminster party. It, ne it they'd had I think two MPs in twenty five years. So it was never really a, a force in the parliament. It was always capable of getting European MEPs, uh, MPs, basically, <clears throat> because huge swathes of the British public absolutely fucking hate Johnny Foreigner over on the British con on the continent, and would like to send a bunch of British patriots over there to give them a piece of their mind. Uh, which is that, and that UKIP did a ph phenomenal job at, which is why Farage got so famous, in fact. Um, so I don't think that the outcome was actually in doubt. I think it was kind of preordained in a way because of Farage's decisions because he wasn't the commander of UKIP exclusively. And the Brexit party was set up... But in, in the UK, you can you require two people to set up UKIP. And uh, Farage did it with a guy called Gwen Towler. I mean, it was very nice. You know, Farage was very nice as well. You know, I met these people. They're very nice people. Um, but this is kind of like boomer internal politics between Bar uh, Farage and Batten. And various other people. I mean, like they, they, I, there are people who will try to drag you into factional politics, but I just didn't care. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not for one faction or another. I just wanted UKIP to act like the revolutionary force it's trying to be. Uh, and after achieving Brexit, that's a great start. But UKIP had great consensus on a bunch of other what we'll just call populist issues, um, and not, not, not just right wing either. Like UKIP is not a far right party. In many respects, they resemble the old Labour Party before Tony Blair um, because they're very working class, because these issues are pro-British working class issues. However, the modern Labour Party can't stand those things. And the the, the problem with UKIP is it can never fully professionalise. You know, if, if it became a, a slick political machine like Labour and the Tories and that the Lib Dems were trying to be, then it could have done very well because its policy platform is actually very, very popular. Um but yeah, so yeah, um, but yeah, I, I I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very fun. It was they were all nice people. Um, it was quite crazy looking back on it. I was just like, wow, this is a great ride, you know. My the the campaign to me was the best thing in the world. I I had such a good time. I have absolutely no regrets whatsoever. All right, so my own uh, personal question here: I was watching some of your videos before this um, catching up, um, and. I, I could have sworn I heard you mention something about this. Um, did you catch the uh, debate between Stefan and Vosh? Yes, and the Dank one. Okay. What did you think of the one between Stefan and Vosh? Uh, kind of almost tickled just to hear that because we actually hosted that. Oh, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, Stefan handled himself very well. And pinning Vosh into the indefensible position of co-ops for thee and not for me... Um, was hilarious, actually. It's, if you could, you, you couldn't find any better proof that worker cops are obviously not a very um, uh, optimal solution to grow a business by the fact that the person advocating them won't do it himself, even though all the tools are at his disposal. Like, I don't even know why he wouldn't like launder his fame into starting a co-op. Like, start a channel that's a worker co-op if it's so great. I mean, you've got the base that's the main Vorsch channel. Okay, start a second channel with a bunch of people. And you can all do it. And think how much more successful you'll surely be if worker cops are so great. But, um, yeah, Vorsch looked like a terrible hypocrite. He looked like his ideas were weak. And uh, it was embarrassing, actually. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, Jordan wants to know, uh, you said that warlords would take over an ANCAP society. How would this happen if there are no laws where mafia crime wouldn't fly in courts, where currently the government does crime legally and services slash free market would replace what the government does but better? Sorry, can you read that again? I, I'm trying to follow the structure of it, but maybe I'm missing it. Um, say, say that again, please. You said that warlords would take over in an ANCAP society. How would this happen if there are no laws where mafia crime wouldn't fly in courts. Uh, I think he's describing mafia crime as where uh, the government does crime legally 
and he's also saying that the services in the free market would replace what the government does, but do it better. Yeah, the, the, the problem is things like courts are compulsory. The, the authority comes from this. The authority for courts comes from the government. And this is why we have particular restraints on it. We, we demand impartiality and objectivity under the rule of law. Um, if these things were done by money, I mean, I, what are you going to do? Pay someone to turn up at the courts? Why should they? You know, if you're going to pay them to turn up at the court, you pay them and they don't turn up. What are you going to do? <laughs> pay them to turn up again at the court hearing for the, the money you took and you didn't arrive at? And surely that would be illegal, right? I mean, you know, and who sets the laws? You know, the, the, the whole thing breaks down. It doesn't work. There's no legitimacy underpinning it that makes people go along with it. And that if you just want to use unreasoned force, then you end up in the situation of a median dialogue. So it's just like, I will make you do this because I'm strong enough and you're weak enough. So this is going to happen. And that's not going to produce a very good society itself because people are going to band against that and form anything that seems like a fair alternative than just being predated on by the strong. Uh, so, yeah, the, I, it's not going to work. All right. Uh, Patar wants to know, uh, were you actually snorting something in the Scarface of a Cod video? No, I have hay fever. Like... Uh, I love this, right? I love, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Scarface of a cat. It's like, dude, I'm a 40 year old dad of two. <laughs> I'm married, right? <laughs> where, where am I getting coke from? <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, I would love to be this wild party animal who's constantly snorting coke and shagging transgender hookers and all this stuff. Okay, yeah, this sounds great, but my wife is really angry, so I'm not going to do those things. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no, I have hay fever, and it's it's really annoying because it like all it is is like snot and mucus. And I didn't really want to blow my nose on camera because you get a lot of snot and new mucus coming out of your nose, and sometimes it doesn't all get contained within the tissue, right? And so you you move away, you lean away because it's disgusting, and no one wants to see that. And now I'm Scarface. <laughs> <laughs> it's way cooler. You keep. I don't. I mean, don't tell anyone that I told you that I wasn't snorting coke, because this makes me seem kind of lame. No, I was doing coke just before I went and shot up a room full of baddies. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> <laughs> as if I'd be so stupid as well. No, no I'm not nearly that cavalier. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, Vanquisher. Ah, oh, Jesus. Words are hard. <laughs> Vanquisher wants to know, based on your research and knowledge, whose cause do you support? in uh, Kashmir, India or Pakistan? Um, I don't know anything about the Kashmir situation. I'm vaguely aware that it's a contested province between India and Pakistan. I don't know the legitimacy of either claim, and I don't just want to seem bigoted against one side over the other, uh, so I'm afraid I can't answer that. All right. Steve Preston wants to know, do you think that the term SJW has become cringe due to overuse? And if so, what other term would you propose to describe the same thing? Yeah, I, I'm annoyed at the idea of this um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, if I use SJW in the title of my video, I get loads more clicks. So if there are people who think it's cringe, it's not most people. You know, It seems that there's a, a huge market for that still. Um, but secondly, do we have something better to replace it with? Like, Social Justice Warrior actually really well describes well, those people in a way that they actually would accept themselves. They would probably say, yeah, I am a warrior for social justice. And you see them going, oh, no, I'm a social justice mage or a rogue or whatever. And it's like, fuck, that's actually cool, you know. I wouldn't mind being a social justice barbarian or something. That sounds awesome, right? But obviously I don't want the things that they want, so I can't agree with it. Um, so it's not... It's not a bad term. I mean, it does actually have some real... Which is why it's stuck, obviously. Why it embeds in people's consciousness. Um, but I can understand the argument. But I, it's just so accurate. You know, it's you. if I say, you know, oh, uh, this person's a leftist, you don't really know what kind of leftist. Like, it could be like a based leftist, like Vosh, you know? You'll sit there and tell me about the black crime statistics. No, no, you said they were racist, actually. You won't talk about them. But about the transgenders who are insufferable or anything like this, you know. Or, you know, it could be, it could be like a Jonathan Haidt leftist. Who knows? Or it could be a raging pink head, you know, gender queer screeching furry kin or something. And if I say SJW, you know exactly which one of those I'm talking about. 
so it, it is a term with real use, as cringe as it might sound. Um, but I mean, if people can come up with a better one that properly, more fully encapsulates that or something like that, that isn't cringe, I'm happy to use it. But uh, and the thing is, SJW is nice. It's short, you know. It's easy to write. So I can't think of a better term. But if you do, let me know. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, Yo Mama wants to know: Did Anita Sarkeesian ever hit on you? <laughs> no, not so. <laughs> Although, I mean, I don't know what her courtship's like. Maybe abusing me from the stage is a form of courtship to her. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Brother Gris wants to know, what's next for your political career? Well, I've never really wanted a political career, so I can't imagine I'll have a political career. Um, I, I have no desire for one at all. Um, but I am gonna, I'm going to start a media venture. Uh, and set something up that I guess is going to be called right wing, um, but again I don't really consider myself very right wing politically. I'm, I I can more than accept that there are social needs. But I I think the I think the NHS is a great idea. I just wish that the government would take care of it. And when I say take care of it, I don't just mean throw endless amounts of money at it because that's an untenable proposition. I would like them to make sure that people who shouldn't be using it don't use it. And make sure that the people who are paying for it have access to it. I mean, that just seems reasonable to me. You know, like, restrict, restrict it, British citizens. It's just British citizens that get it free. Then suddenly a lot of the problems go away. Health tourism goes away. This doesn't exist anymore. But now, you know, and but it's, it's, it doesn't matter, you know. It's, it's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, but you, I, I, if it, I think I would consider myself fundamentally a realist. You know, the things that are really going to happen are going to happen. Um, so we shouldn't be projecting our, oh, well, it should be this way. Yeah, 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 shut the fuck up. You know, anyone can say <laughs> it should be this way or the other way. But what is it? And how do we get from here to slightly better tomorrow? You know, and, uh, but yeah, the, um, but yeah, I think that's the answer. Um, so this is my own question. Um, thinking of your kids, are you generally hopeful or fearful about the future of society? I am a terribly optimistic person. I have an unshakable belief in the capacity of human agency. And it's really annoying. Um, it, it's. I wish I could be a fatalist. I wish I could say, oh, no, we're all doomed. Oh, I'm black-pilled, man. You know, I... I People will never change. They can't learn. But I don't. I don't believe this. I, I believe that people are capable of an incredible amount of stuff, and I think they are capable of overcoming the problems that they're going to be faced with. Um, we just need to effectively find all of the insufferable lefty journo types and politicians and activists who get political capital from trying to persuade people that actually they're inferior and can't do anything, and essentially just smother them in their sleep. They'll be like, oh, I know, I know, shh, 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 just let it happen, just let it happen. And then, then we might get somewhere. <laughs> but no, I'm joking. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I actually really do disagree with the, the people who think that we're doomed and can do nothing. Uh, the problem is we just need to match the capacity that we have to the level of knowledge that we have. And uh, I think uh, that's something we're failing at. All right. Another hot one here. Grosses Flugzeug wants to know Coca-Cola or Pepsi? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. We actually did that one, didn't we? I'm yeah, retarded. Coca-Cola. No, it was, it was a different one, I think, but definitely Coca-Cola. Oh, right, right. I just remember the teeth story, so... <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, uh, why do British have such horrible teeth, actually? They actually don't. Um, I, this is probably a stereotype from the 70s, the 60s, or something. Uh, when they probably did, but um, I I actually I, I found some stats on this a few years ago. Uh, apparently, the British don't have worse teeth. Uh, for if you look at like uh, uh, dentists um, and the number of like fillings British people have, and you know repairs and damage that they've done to teeth. Uh, the the problem is that Britain doesn't have the same kind of vanity regarding teeth that America does. 
Uh, British people have got access to dentists like everyone else, and uh, statistically they use them, in fact, to a greater degree than a lot of other places uh, in Western Europe as well and, and North America. Um, it's just that they don't tend to value uh, shoe, uh, polishing their teeth, and you know, it's not a cardinal sin to not get braces, but everyone in America gets fucking braces and everyone gets their teeth polished and all this sort of stuff, um, which I can only put down to a form of vanity since. The statistically, British people have got perfectly healthy teeth. It probably was in like my grandparents and parents' generations that people had shit teeth, though. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question here comes from username Sir Mosley. He wants to know what are the downsides <laughs> no, of fascism. Huh, what's that? Yeah, yeah. Sir Mosley is asking what are the downsides of fascism. Mm -hmm. Signed, your so, favorite politician in British history. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm not a fan of Oswald Mosley, obviously. Um, the, I mean, the fascism has got the same number of downsides as any other form of socialism, uh, because it is a form of socialism. Um, there, are, there are actually quite a few. I mean, metaphysically, positioning the state as God is a mistake, in my opinion. Because that gives the state not only license, but ownership of every th single thing that is produced and every single person that is born. And we're not just the ownership of them, but, uh, well, I mean, when you operate from the position of the state is God and owns everything, then the state has license to do anything. So it will educate you to worship the state and venerate it and, you know, like, ma you know, make sure that anything you do with your life is conformable with the interests of the state. Very much like China at the moment, in fact. Um, you know, social credit systems, fascists would totally have done that had they the technology. Um, this is, I mean, I do think China, China has, a, has become a fascist state. And fascism is an outgrowth of socialism. The, the, the fascists believed that socialism was a dead doctrine and that it couldn't bring about the workers' paradise they're looking for. But what could bring about it is unending devotion to the state. Uh, but I, I really don't like this kind of thing. Um, Again, being absent in your own duty as a self-governing human being and outsourcing that responsibility to another entity, I think is cowardice, it is weakness, it is pathetic, and it is destructive and dangerous in the extreme. You, I would not trust one of these fucks to govern my kitchen and make me my breakfast, let alone tell me that they should be able to control the entire country, because they're sitting there with delusions of grandeur, thinking, oh, I know more than I do, and you fucking don't. And again, the COVID prices crisis proves it politicians are fucking dumb and this is something that christopher hitchens and i tell you what he christopher hitchens said uh he was when he first started interacting with politicians he was surprised at just how uneducated and dull they were and i've met some politicians who are very bright but most of the politicians that i've met so far and i've met a few have not been terribly bright there's just a kind of format to do politics that you can learn and it's not very complicated it doesn't require deep thinking which is why you get people like Diane Abbott in politics, you know, Sarah Palin, you know, these sort of people who can play the game but don't necessarily understand why the rules are the rules. Um, shit, what was the question again? I'm feeling I've gone off on a tangent again. I'm sorry, I was looking for another question. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, 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 I assume that as answers it then, sorry. Let's just I say, yeah, yeah, I think you answered it pretty well. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I forgot thank it you very too. Much. I appreciate that, yeah. Uh, I, can't believe, I can't believe we both forgot the question. Oh, shoot. That was the, um, the one about Oswald Mosley, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, that was right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah why, why fascism shit? Volume one. Uh, <laughs> let's begin with the French Revolution. No, no. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> the, fundamentally, the, the moral claims that they make for the state, I absolutely despise i don't believe that the state should have that much power and and the, the, the thing that annoys me is this is as as an englishman mosley should have known this right because england the course of english history has been for the last like 800 years the restraint on the power of the sovereign you know whether that's the king whether that's a, an elected government whatever it is a constitutional government is the the moral innovation of england and its greatest gift to the world and a fascist order seeks to undermine and undo all that. And it's like, no. I mean, by the very nature, of the, the fascists define themselves as totalitarian. They coined the term. And by the very definition of that, it excludes a constitutional order. And I believe that a constitutional order 
<coughs> is supremely important for the protection of the rights of the individual against their own government because most ter most most you know like um most problems with governments is not from someone else's government you know most governments aren't constantly engaged in wars uh, the problem from people's governments is the tyrannizing of their own people and that's something i think that we should we as individuals would be most concerned about we as communities should be most concerned about uh, autonomy uh, the autonomy of the individual i think is more important than the uh, reach of the state volume two <laughs> <laughs> I, I i've got many criticisms of fashion it's, it's all right stupid confidence and nonsense. <laughs> all right charge a bug wants to know what is your view on social democracy um broadly supported i i think that's uh i think it's fine to have social programs i think it's desirable in many ways like i said the nhs i think is a very desirable thing to have but you have to be strict about it because otherwise it becomes a black hole for money and it goes and you just pour it in and it's gone and then you get the leftists going oh tory cuts and you're like what fucking cuts every year they're like here's another 20 billion for the nhs here's another two trillion it's like fucking what where is this money coming from oh me fuck you know <laughs> like it, it, like these things are a good idea. I, you know, they they are part of a wholesome society, right? They're, they're part of a, a a society that does want to look after its weakest members. But that society has to understand that it can't expand itself through mass immigration constantly forever. You know, it's it just financially will not bear out, and so that you have to be able to put reasonable restrictions on these things, and you have to have it from a moral perspective. Uh, because apparently nobody gives a shit about the economic one. Um, so yeah, I, I, broadly supportive. You know I mean, like a, a social democracy uh, can involve, you know, a, the government could give you loans. You know, so um, I think in the UK we have the student loans companies. I think it's private, but uh, it's heavily regulated by the government, so it can't charge you X amount interest. Blah 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 blah. So if it, essentially it was the government giving you the loan, um, that would be fine. You know, I, I would under, I would completely understand that, and you just pay the government loan back over time. Like the, these could all be aspects of a social democracy that I would be completely in favour of, because I I do recognise that it is hard when you're poor. I come from a working class family. I you know my father my father worked hard and became a sergeant in the RAF, which gave I think it was about thirty five thousand dollars a year, which is not a large amount of money. And my mum worked part time as like a cleaner and stuff like this. Um, and we were fine, you know, it was lower middle class, but we, we were fine. But a lot of my family was still working class. And so I can see the tangible difference there. It's, you know, it's, this is why I'm very familiar with the fact that they're not stupid. They're just handy. You know, they work with their hands. They're not academic. And that's fine. Because many a time have I been outsmarted by my cousins. You know, they're not stupid. They're just, they just think about the, the way that they do things differently. Um, and so, but I, Charles Murray is right, basically, that a bureaucracy will create an intellectual elite that is indistinguishable from like a caste system. System. Mm -hmm. So it is something we have to be aware of. All right, Seesaw wants to know: Do you like trains? Um, when I need to get somewhere, <laughs> and I can't get there by car. <laughs> all right um <clears throat> let's see Chegward thatcher wants to know do you believe in ending the war on drugs yeah i mean there are two two reasons um one it's been a complete failure like it just hasn't worked uh if, if you were a strategist and you saw something that was not producing the the result you were hoping for and was incarcerating a lot of people for what is essentially a non-violent, a, no, a victimless crime. And in many ways it is. Uh, there are, obviously, depends on the drug. But uh, let's say for, for weed, um, it essentially is a victimless crime. The, I mean, it depends on where you get the weed from, obviously. But in principle, it could be a victimless crime. You, know, you could just allow farmers to grow it in the US. And I'm sure they are now as well. I'm absolutely certain they are. And then you... You sell it legally, what the, the many states are now doing, like three or four of them are now doing, and no problem at all. Um, the, it seems that it just strategically has not worked. You know, whatever it is they thought they were doing, it just didn't work. And it got a lot of people locked up who weren't really a danger. And so that seems unnecessary. 
Well, not the only reason for locks on up is because they're a danger, but there's a different story. The, I think the moral problem with weed as well um, is not, uh, and drugs generally, is not really very bad. Like, it's it's wrong, it's not virtuous to get hooked on a drug and to take drugs, etc., etc. But it, it's not necessarily a great moral evil. Um, and then thirdly, I don't think the government has any fucking right to tell me what I take. I put in my body. You know, if I want to put something toxic in my body, I fucking will. Why? Because it's my body. You know, you don't get to decide for me. I get to decide. I have decided I don't want to take heroin. If you make le heroin legal tomorrow, I'm not taking heroin because I think it's a bad thing. You know, in the same way, I'm not taking sugar, you know? But by the same logic, I'm not saying, you know, ban sugar, ban sugar, because it is bad for you. Sugar is a drug, you know? Um, and I suspect at some point in the future, it probably will be banned by the same kind of meddling busybodies that have banned everything else. And... You know, you will get the Edgar Friendlies of the future running, going, no, I want to, you know, run through the streets naked, eating buckets of cheese, but instead be eating sugary chocolate, you know, or something like that. It's, I, you know, I think we should have the right to do these things. Because, again, like, a life without roughness and coarseness is... It, it produces a different kind of person. It produces a kind of person that doesn't know what it's like to actually suffer, actually have any depredation. And not only that, have certain kinds of pleasure that are intermingled with the idea of pain, like smoking, right? It's not pleasurable to have your first cigarette, and it's not pleasurable to smoke excessively because it's a sore throat, but it still is pleasurable to smoke, you know? And so I don't think the government should be able to deny me that, even if it's not good for me, especially if I pay my taxes to the NHS, damn it. You know, I'm entitled to this. Um, yeah. All right, so I know you, you did address this recently in the video, but... I assume most people here didn't see it. Is it okay it. if we make this the last one? Because I've got a really drive through and I've run out of tea. Um, and it's coming on midnight. Have you been smoking? Um, yes. <laughs> Alright, so. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a few people that wanted to know. Um, Igor Das is the one asking this. He wants to know, would you debate Vosh if it was done in a third party uh, with proceeds to charity? I'm on his own channel. I don't, I'm not bothered about any of that. Um, I've debated him twice already. Like, I, I'm happy to debate anyone in, in any particular kind of circumstance. I'm not bothered about any of that. Okay. So we like setting these up. Would you, uh, if we contacted him and tried to work out a date with your organizer, would you want to do that here? I'm, I'm more than happy to. I wouldn't mind uh, talking to Destiny again as well. I, I actually quite like Destiny. Um, I, know, I know that in many circles he's not popular. Of all this sort of, like, um, I just call it leftists, even though I don't think he's too much of a leftist, really. Uh, of all of them, I've found him to be the most um, able to honestly construct the opponent's position, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's over-egging the situation either. I think that's true. I think he can accurately construct an opponent's position. Um, and that, I think, is the most respectable aspect of any form of debater. You know, someone who can Give, not not just steel man, you know, but just accurately do it. So, you know, steel manning, you know, that's requires you to get into the mindset of someone who thinks it's wonderful. Uh, but to give it an accurate characterization, I think is important, and I think Destiny is capable of doing that. Uh, I, he, I think, when I first spoke to him in like 2016, he couldn't, but in recent years, he's definitely been able to do that, and he's become more critical of the left because of it. It's been very interesting to watch. I don't watch a lot of his stuff, to be honest. I, I don't watch a lot of anything. That's not a judgment. I'm just not busy with some shit. Um, <laughs> oh, no, it's just, it's just, life is just never-ending. I, I honestly thought, oh, coronavirus, brilliant. Oh, no, uh, you've got, I've got the same workload, but now I have to take the kids out for a walk every day just to get them away from my wife. <laughs> you know, because she's stuck with them all day, every day. And, it's, and for her, that's you know one hour of peace every day away from the kids. Oh, thank God for that. But that means I now have another job. I have to get up and do, all, in addition to all the other things I've got to do. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to debate anyone, really. All right. Well, um, yeah, we have uh, we have a good relationship with them. We've had the, them on quite a few times, and uh, I'll reach out to them. I'm sure they'd be happy to, and I'll get in touch with your organizer. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds great. Sounds great. Just let Cal know. And, uh, I mean... I, Probably, it, it might have to be in a couple of weeks' time because we've got some stuff coming up, but like, I'm happy to do it. So just speak to him. He'll pencil in time, and then we'll, we'll get it done. All right. I look forward to it. Thanks again so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Um, hope you take some you know, cold medicine and uh, you, you get that throat sorted out. 
Well, it's, no, no, there's nothing wrong with my throat. I've just been speaking for like two hours and I haven't had a drink. Oh, that. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, but it's also getting late and I need to get up tomorrow. Because, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always the guy who sleeps in and my wife's getting angry with that too. So I'm like, I'm just do it. Take it get up early for a bit so she can have a lie in. Because I mean, it's not like anyone's got anywhere to go, is it? Um, but yeah, no, this has been really fun. I, I, is, is there somewhere I can read people's comments on it? I'm interested to know what people think of stuff I've said. Uh, so yeah, no, no um, so, uh, we've got the Sargon of Akkad, uh, questions channel, and right above that is AMA discussion. Uh, people have been yeah. commenting in there as we go along, so. Right, sorry, I haven't, I haven't been following it. I see how I'm not noted. All right. Um, <laughs> thanks, Nifty. Um, <laughs> but, uh, just to address, uh, one of the things in the chat, objective morality, it, it, it is, it is possible to have objective morality, um, the problem is found, finding a foundation for it, a mooring for it. Um, it no, Musa, the, you can have morality that is objective. The, the problem is the, um, the authority on which that objectivity is grounded. Uh, again, with religion, they say, well, God did it, and you have to obey God because he's God. It's like, okay, but I don't believe in God. But this is what Kant was trying to do with his uh, categorical imperative. He was trying to create an objective basis for morality, uh, universalized maxims that we could all use. Um, but uh, hang on, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing people comment on, no, 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 hang on. Um, but so th this is what Kant's trying to achieve, and that is a form of universal morality. The same with uh, utilitarianism. These are forms of, and, and Aristotle actually, you could call this universal ethics because they apply to each person. But the thing is, if you don't agree with how these things are formulated, then that doesn't make them not universal. It just means you disagree with them, and you think they're wrong. Uh, but they are they are still objective. Um, not that that necessarily means anything. Um, Nick Fuentes, uh, he I, he's, he's probably a white nationalist. I don't know, but I, I don't actually watch any of his stuff. But I've seen clips, and he is a funny guy. You know, you you've got to give him that at the very least. He's a funny guy. Um, uh, there was something else I wanted to address as well, <laughs> very quickly while I'm here. Um, there's, there's a question about classical liberalism that I'll, I, I'm not going to answer now but it's the sort of thing I will answer again in the future because it's a long answer um, uh, there was something I wanted to get but I I can't I oh, know it's alright I've lost it but so anyway I hope um, do I think Andy Worski is right with beliefs I don't think Andy Worski understands what a belief is like he just left out of money and he's where's he where is he now man you know it's like, and the thing is, I don't even dislike Worski. I know he's a nice guy, but he's just weak. He's he's Aristotle's incontinent man. He knows what the right thing to do is, but man, he has got no self control whatsoever. You know, none at all. He's he's not the sort of malicious types who surrounded him and took advantage of him. Um, but that makes him just an idiot. You know. So on the left wants to take away your penis. Yeah, I'm very aware of that. Holy oh, shit, man. Do you not think I I am worried for my five year old son, man? Like, did you see? It, this week, it came came out that the government was teaching them about trans porn in the Kent univers uh, Kent school for eleven year olds, and it's like, fucking, what are you doing? The left doesn't hold children sacred, and that's bad. Um, but anyway, uh, I think I'll leave there because I really do need to go get a drink. You can probably hear the the, the, the my voice so I've got to go. <laughs> It's coming on midnight, so. But I I I love talking to chats who are not necessarily uh, friendly fans of mine I, I love talking to them um but i hope i hope i've i hope i've given some interesting answers you know i hope them i i hope they there was a depth to them that you perhaps weren't expecting yeah i I, I mean i i think this was generally good uh there was really good uh answers and yeah i definitely look forward to having you on again this was fantastic yeah great um okay great well thank you very much everyone i'll uh, i'll probably leave the discord server um not out of any malice or anything, but because I've got a long list of them and I can never remember what any of them are. And so I just, you know, if you, next time you want me to talk, just re-invite me and I'll come back in. All right, so, we'll do. But, uh, but it, sorry, it's, I, you know, I get loads of notifications and messages and stuff, so it's, I've, got to, I've got to manage it, unfortunately. Guys, but, um, but thank you very much for having me on. This has been really fun. And I'll speak to you all later. All right, all the best. All right, guys. So I don't know about you. I thought that was pretty fantastic. 
I'm going to close down uh, this VC now. I'm going to move down, I think, to... Excuse me. I've been having a couple beers during this. I'm going to move down to uh, the politics chat if it's open. Uh, yeah, it's just a couple people from this. So if you guys want to slide down there, this chat's being closed down, and we can uh, yeah, chit-chat there about this. Oh, here we go. Yo. Uh... Oh, Lord. I hope I didn't cause any more uh, Worski Sargon drama with that question. The left wants to take away your penis. <laughs> <laughs> I left for that. <laughs>